thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. It's really, really cold out there. So you had to, you know, make your way through the weather. Good job. Um, first, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, Google, SF, um, for sponsoring us and providing the extremely delicious food back there. And we also want to thank Pixie. Uh, Pixie is my startup. Um, we are a mobile AR, AI, and blockchain social commerce platform. Uh, we're currently in stealth mode, so I don't share a lot of information. Um, if you're interested, please uh, you know please email me at Anna at the pixieapp.com. You can take pictures if you want. <laughs> uh, but we're looking for especially um, iOS and blockchain engineers. And I mean, if you're not an engineer, we're still interested in talking to you if you want to be a part of something super cool. All right, so I like to start off these uh, meetup events with a quick investment update. And, and when I say investment update, I mean the AR industry and, uh, specifically. So right now, the latest numbers are that within five years, um, and today, actually, compared to other times, it's going to be more of a comparison and contrast between AR and VR industries. So if within five years, we expect AR to have an installed base of 3.5 billion devices. Uh, VR is expected to have between 50 to 60 million. Um, and in terms of market size, we're expected the AR industry to have between 85 to 90 billion versus VR's 10 to 15 billion. So let's look at this graph. Um, numbers all, are all taken off except for the dates or the years. Um, but it shows you just graphically uh, the difference with the composition of the AR and VR industry together and the breakdown. And the market is expected to be predominantly AR versus VR. First of them is the installed base. <coughs> So we expect um, for this year there to be 900 million um, installed base, or that means devices that will be able to do AR. If you look um, at the two different, so they're put side to side, um, side by side, and the one on the left includes mobile AR, the one on the right excludes mobile AR. And you'll see that the dark blue uh, that you see in each bar um, is mobile AR. And I've already established that we expect mobile AR to be much greater. Okay, so in addition to the installed bases, um, the differences between AR and VR is that so far, AR has been mostly ported over. Um, I don't know how many developers are here, but um, any AR before was really kind of only Unity or built on Unity. But, um, you know, Apple came out with their Air Kit and Google came out with their Air Core. Um, enabling the rest of developers to uh, build for iOS uh, devices as well as, um, you know, Android devices. And what's also very interesting about AR is that we're expected to have a lot of different potential applications of AR. Um, in the VR industry, we expect predominantly VR to be used for entertainment and games. Whereas within AR, we expect um, e-commerce and a variety, an actually an explosion of industries um, to benefit from AR. This um, just shows um, some of the expected categories within e-commerce to benefit from AR. The top three are clothing, consumer electronics, and automotive. So as AR um, adoption spreads, we expect companies from a variety of verticals to spend ad dollars on AR. And the top three here are retail, automotive, and financial services. We expect um, enterprise uses of AR to also be more widespread because compared to VR, um, mobile AR in particular is expected to be uh, lower cost um, and also more ubiquitous because of the greater installed base. And lastly, um, we expect AR to be bigger than VR because the map of AR industry uh, follows more of the, the footprint of phones and tablets, whereas for VR, it actually follows more just uh, games. And we expect um, Asia, predominantly China, Korea, and Japan to dominate 
the industry. All right, so I'm going to pass the baton to our first demoer, Will, from USENS. Thank you. Uh, just going to get this set up. Okay. Uh, yeah, just quickly a little bit on who we are at USENS. So uh, we're a company steeped in computer vision. Uh, all our founders are engineers, will come from companies like uh, Panasonic, Nokia, or Nokia has been taught to say it, Amazon, Apple, Intel. Um, so we, we came together, uh, originally as a company, we were trying to get into the all the one headset, um, but now we're, we're more known for our hand tracking. So uh, we use hand tracking and virtual reality uh, based on computer vision, uh, cameras essentially, to use your hands, you can use them in augmented reality, virtual reality environments. So we started out in gaming, VR, but um, you know, VR is a big one, gaming is going to be AR a bit more in the future, which Anna was discussing. But uh, we're actually getting more into all sorts of IoT devices. So, you know, there's some smart TV companies we're talking to. Uh, Biden is a smart car company in China. We're actually providing their hand tracking for, uh, for their car. Uh, but, you know, today we're talking a bit more about USENS AR. Uh, but we're also, we're in San Jose is our, uh, is our headquarters. We have three R&D offices around China as well. Um, so we talked about our single... And get, uh, our hand tracking, but just to talk about what I'll be displaying today, which is USENS AR. So uh, Anna talked a little bit about AR Core and AR Kit. Uh, what USENS AR is, is trying to bring uh, augmented reality to all of Android. So uh, how this opportunity came about was, you know, since we're computer vision, AR is all about computer vision, uh, we, were, we have around six stuff slam, which was going into our original heads that we were meant to build. And it has uh, spread to us, which is a Qualcomm of China, essentially an SOC company, and they create very entry-level smartphones. I have one here. It's about eighty dollars, really lightweight. It's pretty much the bare, bare minimal smartphone requirements you can get. And they wanted to bring AR to their users. So uh, you know, AR Core, which we're, uh, people are familiar with now in Google, uh, they're focusing more on you know the S8s, the top-end phones. And then when people start recycling, as Anna showed in the chart, you know, by two thousand twenty. Uh, then we're going to have more, you know, more AR-enabled apps. But in the meantime, we want to bring it to as many users as possible. So with the USENS AR, we actually work across all of Android. Uh, so we provide, you know, it's a development kit which uh, developers can have. We, we partner right now, we're partnering with uh, big content agencies, or uh, we're actually trying to go directly to phone manufacturers <laughs> so we can basically boost uh, their AR capabilities for their developer base. Uh, and I'll show you a quick demo of that, because I know we need to pass on. And we'll also have a, a table after if anyone wants to uh, talk more about it. <coughs> yeah. So I have a, a Samsung S8 here. You know, this is AR core enabled, but just for the purpose of this demo. But we can also show a demo afterwards on the Spectrum phone. We also work across all HTC phones. Uh, you know, pretty much all that middle tier. Uh, across all of Android, but performance is best on the S8, so we'll show that for the demo today. So, Andrew, two of, the, two of the things we're very strong on, we're very robust. Uh, you might have seen on you know, AR kit, uh, if you kind of move it around a bit, it kind of can disappear, but it relocalizes there sometimes when it uses track. The second is that uh, we're really good at actual plane detection. So you can see there right under it, so that it's right on there. Uh, sometimes you might have seen from other, uh, other AR engines that it might float around a little bit. But what we really focus on is stability, uh, which is the most important thing. You know, when you're building an app, you want it to be as stable as possible. Uh, and we've also, of course, tried to open up the, uh, the market by bringing it to 2 billion Android devices before 2019. So um, in short, you know, we're opening up our SDK in Q2. Uh, we're accepting some beta testers. And uh, if you're interested in getting on board, you can go to our website, sign up, or just talk to me after, and we'll get set up. But uh, I think we've, we've got time for questions, or do we do that at the end? We have a question. Yes, Time for question. I saw him there. Hi there. Are you guys trying to be the uh, Unity for AR and VR? Uh, no. no. We're, <laughs> good, good question. That would be a, a nice idea. So uh, we're very much focused on just being an SDK for developers. What we're starting here is, you know, with the basic, uh, you know, AR, which we've all seen, but we're trying to add on some additional things. Uh, hand tracking is something we're going to bring. I am very excited about that because, you know, you want to be able to interact, especially in AR glasses and phones. You don't want to be just touching the screen. We want to move beyond that. Uh, we see smartphones as very much a temporary solution while people get used to AR, but AR glasses in 2019 is really when things are going to take off. And that's where we think of hand tracking and everything else starts to develop. Well. And just one more. Okay. Are you going to support anything beyond the Snapdragon 835? 
like Exonos, uh, yes. Huawei, things like down the road, because the 6XO thing is unique to the A35 Snapdragon platform. Yeah, so in terms of chips, I mean, uh, the Spectrum chip, this is using its own uh, chip, and this is pretty much as cheap as it comes. So the entire purpose of our project was, if we can get it working on this phone, which is the bare minimum entry-level smartphone, we can work on anything. So once we had it on, uh, we've got it working on this, um, Spectrum's going to release it in their 2018 18 phones, they expect about 100 million across China. Uh, we started porting it to, you know, HTC phones, LG, uh, Motorola's, and, and it worked. And then uh, that's why we're working on the SDKs. We can open it up and developers start to use it. And then we're gonna add on some additional features afterwards, like hand tracking and uh, facial recognition, object recognition, et cetera. And just uh, one more here. Yeah, I, I hate to uh, bring up the financials of this because the technology is so cool. Yeah. What is your take on the competition? Uh, specifically Magic Leap, for example, or other. Yeah, so we're, we're, not a, we're not a headset manufacturer. I might have been, might have been confusing because uh, originally we, were, we built that, but then we took our core technologies with hand tracking and uh, six off slam, and we separated it, so now we lost license those technologies. So we, uh, we're a partner. You know, we partner with headset manufacturers. Uh, we integrate our technology with hand tracking, and then on the AR side, we're working with developers and content developers. Great. Okay. And I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you all after you've tested it. So actually, first of all, uh, my name is Shang, uh, one of the co-hosts of ARVC. So welcome everybody. This is probably a, probably the most packed that we've, we've seen this meetup, so it's really cool. Um, so next up we have uh, Kevin with uh, the CEO of Nera. Nera is a design tool that allows anyone to create professional quality AR VR experiences all without 3D experience and without code. So, blow them away, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I want to give a, just a little bit of a background on this. Uh, I apologize that it, I, it's probably very quiet in the back. I'll try to speak up as much as possible. Uh, we started this project about a year and a half ago, sort of with the idea that, um, given our backgrounds in design, that design was going to play a role in AR and VR. Um, and we didn't really see anyone addressing that problem. Uh, the idea, big idea here is that we really want to allow everyone to be able to create AR and VR. So like the, the devs in this, audience, uh, in this audience are not really who we're after, though you could use our tool as a really, really fast prototyping tool, but we're really after everyone else. And so that could be, you know, if you, if you want to shorthand it, it's kind of like looking at the same sort of audience that Squarespace might have or someone like that. Um, and so the, the thing is, is templatized um, and is completely drag and drop. They're literally, you can't code in this. Um, and so that has a couple of implications. Um, so this is, a, this is the editing environment um, and it runs across uh, most platforms, eventually all of the platforms. Um, and this is running in a, in a web browser um, and uh, also runs in, as of two weeks ago in ARKit. Um, and if the HDMI cooperates, I'll show you this in a second. But what, what you're actually looking at here um, from, a, from a sort of editing point of view, there's video files that aren't running uh, and some things like sound files. And this is all truly just sort of you're able to move this. This is your initial camera position that you can do any number of things with. Uh, we paid very close attention to things like typography um, that's you know traditionally very challenging um, from from some points of view around rendering capabilities in AR and VR. We worked hard to make sure that that wasn't the case. It publishes in 591 languages uh, out the box. I didn't even know there were 591 languages until we did this project. Um, and and so the templates vary in terms of complexity. You know this is this is a pretty sort of gamified view of things, but there's also sort of just blank environments and very simple environments. And just to give you a sense of sort of what some of those things look like, I think we've got something like 50 of these in here now. And the idea is that we continue to bring in artists and architects and different people to create these sort of template environments. In the long run, as we start to get uh, more out there, the other idea is that we have templates that are specific to certain verticals. So if you're an educator, you're able to take content from a certain educator uh, and, and use that as a starting point so long as that creator allows you to do it. Um, but right now, these are all sort of pre-rendered environments um, that vary in sort of style and lots of skyboxes and, and color fields and things of that nature. So you saw the Japanese temple uh, environment there just a second, which is our uh, courtyard house. Uh, which, uh, which is I'm going to show you hopefully in AR if this uh, HDMI cooperates. 
We also have the idea of a market here. So we're uh, right now we've pre-populated this with things like 360 files, uh, you know, uh, 3D files, uh, sound files, and so forth. But the idea is that we open this up to everyone uh, to contribute. So the community, Creative Commons, um, Poly, all of these things, so that creators have instant access. They don't need to leave the application in order to get new things into their environments uh, and to their experiences. Um, so just really quickly. Um, this at the bottom is sort of the main control. This is the library. There's all the different asset types that you can sort by. Um, and then these are some of the main things that you're able to pull in. So 3D objects, OBJs, FBXs, uh, 2D images, 2D video, 360 images and video, which you can also use then as a scene if you want to. Any number of scenes that you can branch off. Uh, like I talked about text, hotspots, uh, audio of all kinds, 360 audio. Um, directional audio uh, pathing tool which allows you to take people from one place to the next and then really one of the bigger ideas that we're operating under as a sort of design oriented company uh, the idea of sort of design modules and so this is an initial sort of charting tool which will allow you to create 3d charts uh, line charts and bar charts but eventually we're going to continue down the path of doing things like pre-done timelines and other things that people will find hopefully find useful um, so this uh, will uh, run in the desktop as well, um, and I'm going to try to show you the AR version. We just launched the app uh, two weeks ago, uh, AR Kit. Sort of resize this in front of me. This is the same Japanese courtyard uh, in front of us, but I can then sort of do whatever I need to do. There's two modes within this. This is going to be way too loud, but there's, there's the idea that you can do this as a diorama, sort of as a dollhouse, or you know, this is really mad at me. It's way cranky. Uh, you can also do it in immersive mode, which is basically you can also do it in immersive mode, so which is actually like a like the VR mode just with the sky gone. So you can use it as a dollhouse. You can also view it in content only mode, which is whatever you put in. You can then have floating space and have all of the same level of interactivity. And I'll cut it off there. What's the most uncomfortable or unknown question anybody could ask you right now? <laughs> <laughs> Are you a <laughs> Like I'm going through a divorce? Like I'm <laughs> yeah, it's about where it's going. Like what, what do you what do you think is uh, and I don't want to bring up Magic Leap all the time as I did with yeah. this gentleman, but uh no, I mean, there the stuff are, that keeps, there are unknown things out there. Yeah, I mean the stuff that keeps me up at night are, are people like Adobe coming into this space. We have some advantages because we can sort of partner an API with everyone where most people are gonna have to play in their sandboxes. Um, but, you know, eventually we expect that this space is going to get super crowded. Um, but I think we're one of the first people to really push this from a sort of everyone can do it point of view. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, can we publish uh, apps on uh, Google uh, Play? Say that again. Can we publish the apps for Google Play? No, it's the same question that she just asked. It's all cloud hosted right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, if uh, this platform is uh, supposed to be like popularized. Yeah. How do you how do you think that's going to happen? Well, to become you, popular. Yeah, everyone? yeah. I mean, that, I, right now there isn't any way for people to really jump into AR and VR. So we've got to do a good job of getting the word out about this, so that people that have headsets, like, oh, I can actually create shit. That's cool. <laughs> like that's the general idea, or that from a business point of view, like. Oh, I've got a gallery, and I can go and actually create a gallery for people to, to exist in. Like, it, there's a huge number. It's kind of this, literally the same like audience that of, as Squarespace. Like, we, we anticipate that that's the long run. In the short term, we know that it's going to be educators. It's it's training. Uh, it's location based stuff. Um, it's journalists. It's people of that build straight out the gate. But we do think that it's really wide in the long run. Yeah. How do you think this differentiates from things like the central and second life, or you can also paint the readily visual virtual space for every single world? Ours isn't an ICO scam. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, 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 so I, I don't know if you've seen the render quality of that stuff. We really are pushing a sort of a design point of view. So I, I you know, we are anticipating that 
we will differentiate pretty pretty quickly around from a design standpoint, from a polish perspective, I think primarily. And it's also Decentraland is very much around sort of the real estate like Second Life was. We're not really pushing that angle at all. Yeah, it's all separate. Everyone's got a separate experience. In the long run, if people want to wire to each other, they can. Yeah, but we're not we're not trying to sell, sell it from like a land perspective. I'm a content, a content producer from, from Brazil. I have a, a film company producer back there. Yeah. And uh, I don't get it, the, the, the meeting of your business kind of is focused on uh, uh, for what kind of plug? For designers, for developers, or uh, I want to, to, to build something in, in, in VR or VR, in AR or, or, or VR stuff, and I can be able to publish there in, I don't know, an Oculus store or. No, you, you, so if you're a developer, you, it's, it's easy to use our tool for sort of prototyping. It's like you, five minutes you got you can show an idea off. It's pretty cool. But so inside our platform, yeah, it's really not meant for devs at the end of the day. It's it's really meant for people that want to publish 360 content or for organizations that want to use a design tool for like their design teams. Right now, it's not very organized, but we anticipate, like we've seen in every other sort of major medium before it, that there will be teams of people that are responsible for pr producing XR content, and we want to create a tool for them to make that easy. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. So if you want to come in afterwards as well, the rest of the demo is actually pretty cool. I've actually seen it before. So, I mean, this whole suite of new development tools is really important to the emerging field of AR, VR. And this is probably a great segue into our speaker series right now. And today we actually have a rare opportunity to have not just one, but actually two speakers from Google, one on the content provide, content creation side and one on the optical side. So hardware as well as the software and content. So where is uh, Lulu Lamer? I know it's, oh, okay, there you are, there you go. It is so crowded today that our speakers couldn't even find a seat in the front, so. <laughs> So while Lulu is getting set up, I'll give a quick intro to her. Uh, Lulu Lamera is uh, the senior producer in Daydream's third-party AR VR content group. Before coming to Google, she was a studio director, exper experimental AR VR and video game studio Phenomena. And Phenomena, thank you. Ah, <laughs> uh, there you go. And uh, before that, she spent many years in triple A console and PC games from System Shock 2 and Borderlands, which um, I admittedly have spent uh, countless hours on, actually both one and two. <laughs> so she will talk about the immersive computing with AR Core. There you go. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to talk uh, about um, first what, uh, what Google is, how we think about AR uh, and VR and sort of immersive computing. Then I'm going to give kind of a general overview about how AR Core works. Um, then I'll talk a little about some best practices um, in AR, both uh, technical and uh, some design stuff. So to start off, how many of you are uh, developing <coughs> AR, and when I say developing, I mean content or code, um, AR apps? Some, and how many of you are on the sort of a, working in AR but uh, not on the app side? Few, few, okay, cool. Um, interesting, and, okay. <laughs> more than I was expecting. Interesting, okay. So let's talk first about um, how Google thinks about AR and VR. Um, we're on the cusp, as everybody is always saying, about AR and VR, of this big revolution. Um, and where we are is going from mobile to immersive computing. Um, at Google, we think that VR plus AR uh, is the next computing platform. Um, and it will be as powerful and as disruptive and valuable as this last jump to mobile and the previous jump to, uh, to, inter to the internet, et cetera. Um, at Google, immersive computing is like one big happy family. We're, we're one group, AR and VR. And we think of AR and VR as two ways of looking at things, right? VR can take you anywhere, uh, and AR can take anything to you. So you all know that 
uh, Android is the world's most popular mobile platform. Of course, two billion plus uh, <laughs> devices. Everybody knows this. <laughs> so since uh, Android's launch in 2008, these, these phones have become more useful. They've become richer experiences. Uh, they're more powerful, they're easier to use, there's more, uh, more inputs and more sensors, right? And AR is, we think of as the next big shift in what's possible with these devices, right? We're stacking on top of, of the gains that we've made in the past. AR brings information to you in the context of the real world to where it is useful to you where it's accessible to your users. Um, and as you all probably know, Google's been developing AR tech since 2014 with, the, with Tango. Um, Tango used uh, two cameras to see the world in 3D, um, very much like the Kinect, very much like the um, front-facing camera on the iPhone X. Um, it mapped indoor spaces with a very high degree of accuracy and allowed you to place virtual objects in the real world. So we're we've taken everything that we learned from Tango to make AR available at Android scale without special hardware. Those extra cameras, hard to get in, into the phones, right? Um, and it was only in two different, two small phones, two, you know, small reach. So that brings us to AR core. The world of AR today is totally mobile. Um, users want quick, easy accessibility from a device that they already own, that they already carry around. They want to buy the best new phone and have all of the features, right? That's why we built AR Core, um, to enable AR at Android scale. At the moment, uh, in, we're in developer preview for AR Core, um, supporting all four Pixel models, 2016 and 2017. Um, as well as the Samsung Galaxy 8 series. AR stickers was sort of our AR coming out. Um, people on Android, Android users, don't really know what, uh, didn't really know what AR was yet, um, or hadn't really experienced it yet. And I certainly, and I'm glad the rest of Google agrees with me, that keeping it I feel like keeping it light and simple and kind of frivolous, playful at the beginning, when you're teaching people how to use things, that's how you teach them something. Make it enjoyable, make it low stakes, kind of stupid, right? <laughs> it introduces the concept to, a wor it, to the world in a way where uh, there's no risk to try it. No risk at all. Like, you're not going to screw it up, you're not going to look foolish, because there's a burger dancing. He looks foolish. <laughs> or she, I guess her name's Patty. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the three sort of major components of AR4 as we think of them. Motion tracking, environmental understanding, and light estimation. So motion tracking. AR4 uses uh, the device's camera uh, and IMU together to track where your device is in the world. Um, called concurrent odometry and mapping. So the camera is looking for visually distinct features that it can track over successive frames. Uh, it builds up a point cloud that it can localize against. We call the points in this cloud uh, feature points. Tracking feature points over time and then merging that data stream with the IMU data gives you rotation and translation in the world so you can re render your virtual content in the right place. <laughs> Our environmental understanding is built up over time using these same feature points. When AirCore sees clusters of feature points that appear to lie on a common horizontal surface, it makes these surfaces available to the app um, as planes. And they're not just like infinite planes, uh, AirCore also provides the known bounds of the surfaces as a flat polygon. Finally, light estimation. Um, AirCore gives you a value representing the average intensity of a given camera image. Uh, this information lets you uh, light your virtual objects under approximately the same conditions as the environment around them, um, increasing the sense of realism. You can also like read this lighting information to make things happen in your scene. Use it as, a, as an event trigger, like this lion getting scared when we turn off the lights. Um, 
With environmental understanding, motion tracking, light estimation, AR Core provides all this information that you need to make your 3D objects look believably placed in the real world. <coughs> And then we bring the AR core to whatever environment uh, you're building your app in. SDK is available for Android, for Unity, uh, and for Unreal 4. So next I want to talk about um, some best practices and design principles. Um, but I don't really want to get ahead of myself because AR is so fresh. So let's say best practices for now, or like baby best practices. <laughs> don't want to oversell. <laughs> So first, uh, you still have to assume, and this is going to be the case for probably another year, that anyone using your app may never have used AR before. Um, one of the things I think is kind of exciting about AR is that we have no kind of social norms or expectations for AR. Um, just earlier today, I was testing out a bunch of AR core apps, and my coworkers were laughing at me, like, what are you doing, jumping up and like, <laughs> Around. What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> so there, there isn't any context for this. There isn't any expectation that people understand what somebody is doing when they're walking around with their phone like this. And so you, you have to know that people are going to be embarrassed and have to have a reason to do it. Right? Um, you need to help the user know how to get started. First off, of course, you need to help the user know how to scan for the surface and when that surface is ready for interaction because that is, that's like your entry point uh, into the AR experience. You're probably also going to need to uh, let the user know when they should get closer um, to see something if they want to, because they're going to pinch in Zoom first, right? Um, I worked on a, a Tango app called World and we did a bunch of user testing for it and every single person, we had to tell them, you can get closer. And they were like, oh my god. <laughs> um, I did the same, exactly the same thing the first time I used a Tango myself. Um, so you also, you got to tell the user they, that they can get closer, that they can physically interact with this thing. Um, and you also need to tell people what is interactable and what isn't. Um, any of you game developers or former game developers, Yes, um, my people. So it's the same deal as in game development. We call it visual language. Uh, as these augmented realities get richer, there are more. There's more stuff in the world, and there's some stuff that you can interact with and you can't. And there's an expectation of your user that as these things scale, you can continue to use them. If that's not the case, then you really need to show the user what they can use, what they can't use. So, more best practices. Simple controls. Um, using a, a phone as a sixth off controller is really intuitive once you know how it works. Like I already explained, you've got to give them that first little nudge. Um, if you can interact with your objects, keep it simple and direct. That directness, uh, make, your, make the objects that you can interact with real by letting you touch them and move them and really like almost feel them through your screen. We've, I've seen examples where people are like, go into move mode and then move and then say, yes, I'm done, right? Those take you one step away from the content and make it one step less real. And AR specific UI. Um, I wanna make two points about that. First, sometimes the most effective thing is just to stick some uh, 2D fixed overlays onto the screen, um, but whenever you can, don't pop pass up the opportunity to spatialize your, U your UI to keep your user sort of in this mindset of a deep world that they can interact with. Place the information where it's going to be most valuable to them. So next, um, the believability of your app is really going to come down to the quality of your assets at the end of the day. Um, if you're going really realistic, uh, don't forget about drop shadows and ambient occlusion and all of these kinds of tricks uh, that have been 
expertly honed over the years in uh, in 3D, in VR, video games, etc., to, to make these things really come alive and look real and look rounded out in the world. And then I'm going to make a quick plug for uh, Tilt Brush and Poly and Blocks. Um, our VR uh, creation tools are a great way to prototype um, really simply uh, make 3D assets. Poly allows you to easily download creations from Tilt Brush or from Blocks to use in AR. Uh, you can search Poly. There's thousands of free to use objects, not just built in Tilt Brush and Blocks, but uh, you can upload from other sources as well. Um, and many are free and available for remixing. <coughs> and last, like probably the most frequent question that we're getting from developers uh, as they're working with AR Core is about stability and how, how to get stuff to stick in place. So much so that it gets its own slide. So uh, we talked about how AR Core makes planes out of feature points that appear to lie on co common horizontal services. Um, our understanding of those planes gets better all the time, and then the planes are updated, right? Um, that means that they can merge, and if they appear to be right on top of each other, one of them can disappear entirely. So if you have anything fixed directly to the plane, it's gone. Um, so you want your <coughs> objects to behave as though they are actually fixed in space, so you create an anchor. Um, if you're using Unity or Unreal, you want to parent the virtual object to that anchor and not to the plane. So a couple other keys to stability besides anchors. Also, when in doubt, add another anchor. Um, keep, keep your frame rate steady. Uh, over thir under 30 frames per second not only looks chunky for the user, but it also uh, de degrades your, uh, the quality of tracking pretty significantly. And last, uh, the phone's vibration feedback does mess with the um, with the tracking pretty significantly. So, uh, especially when it's used in a, in a sustained way, if it's over a few seconds, it will really uh, be like an earthquake to your tracking. Um, but our guidance right now is, is really to not use it at all when in AR mode. Thank you. I think that was a really good preview for the software side as well as development tools for software developers on AR. Um, so a lot of attention these days have been really focused on mobile AR, and for good reason, because every one of us pretty much like carries an AR device already. However, for AR to really you know, reach its promise, what people will talk about in terms of like the next generation of computing platform, it really needs to be contextual, it has to be timely, it has to be instantaneous. It actually has to be you know, always on as well. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really, really excited about our next speaker, who is actually going to be work, who is actually working on the HDMD headsets of the future. So, can we actually uh, give an applause for Jerry? He's just right behind the column there. So, I had the pleasure of actually meeting and listening to Jerry um, earlier this year at the SPIE uh, Photonics Conference, which is one of the biggest conferences for optics in the world. And Jerry just blew me away with his energy, his, his knowledge about the field. So you'll, you'll probably get it in a bit. A bit about Jerry, actually. So Jerry Corello joined Google in 2015 and has been involved in a number of optical projects across the company. He started at Google X and has been involved in most of Google's AR and VR projects. And prior to joining Google, he was instrumental in forming Kaiser Electronics HMD team producing some of the most advanced devices of the period. He also was a president of Kaiser Electron, Electro Optics and GM of Rockwell, um, and a whole bunch of other things. But really, just a complete badass in the world of optics. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about the basics of AR VR optics displays and also the new and exciting things that are coming up. So, I'll let you wow, go. Wow, I'm really in trouble here. <laughs> too, much, too much of a build up for this. Do you hear me back there? I really need to be hands free because I'm from Brooklyn and. <laughs> That's kind of it. But uh, Shane said, right, I was at Photonics West, and the same thing happened there, what happened here. We were expecting maybe like 100, 200 people, and we had like close to 700 people get that many physicists in a room. It's, it's really, really scary to, to see that happen. But it just shows the, the incredible interest in augmented reality, virtual reality, and of course, the new word. What is the new one? 
XR. Is it that what they call it? Is it mixed reality or digital AR? Or? I'm getting kind of old. I can't keep up with all, all this stuff. But for me, really, this is kind of late. I take the Google early bus in the morning, so I'm usually in bed about 8:30. So I took the. So when I when I had to do this, I when Shane wrote me, I mean, invited me to, to do this uh, to do this presentation, and I was looking at him, going, "This is just too much stuff for a bunch of Swedes." They're not really going to enjoy this all this too much. So that I kind of changed the presentation a little bit in the title. That's a little tongue-in-cheek kind of stuff. You know, Google, we really can't tell you what the hell we're doing, especially on the hardware side. So I, I'm more or less trying to give a, a brush overview, trying to make it a little funny because there's still a long way to go in this business, in the hardware side. And no one's really totally satisfied with what they're seeing. So we got a long, long way to go. And uh, a lot of us are working at it. I wonder if you asked the guys from Oculus and Vive and Microsoft to come. Maybe they turned it down. So I was maybe next time. Probably not down. Google, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, can't get it going here. There we go. Okay. So I've decided to call it the mystifying AR and VR optics. I don't even think I even do that in this, but it, it sounded better than back to basics. You know, I, it's like <laughs> business to business. I, I, I just, kind of, just just kind of got, got rid of that altogether. So, Lulu did a good job. She helped a lot of things with Google, but since I'm giving the pitch and I'm in big G, you know, mother <coughs> place here, I got to kind of put the big slide up. You know, all the things we did, it started with AR, right? It, you know, Google Glass, went on to cardboard, VR for everybody, then Daydream View, and then all the, the, the apps and things we do that are not uh, gaming based. She talked about Poly, and of course, AR Core Jump, Tilt Brush, and our latest thing that came out all in one with Lenovo, the Lenovo Solo. And YouTube VR, and Google Earth, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff that you know, we're uh, we're playing around in. And just to give you a little background on me, this is just a short. I've been doing this probably longer than a lot of you who old you are. I've been doing this a really a long time. And I'll tell you, the, I always say to people in the H and D business, the landscape is littered with bad H and Ds. <laughs> they really are, right? No, no BS, no bullshit. I mean, it really is. I made some of those too, like, you know, in the, in the 90s and 80s when all the, the VR stuff was kind of going on. But I've been involved and mostly started out in the military, kind of moved into medical, did uh, location-based entertainment, did, did all, all kinds of different things. But mostly really an optics guy uh, way back, but I've also done a lot of uh, general management stuff. So when I came to Google, it was kind of refreshing. I got out of you know, business, reading balance sheets and things like that, and got back to what I really loved, which was, which was optics. You guys all know what augmented and virtual reality is, right? So I don't need to even read these to you. And then there's mixed reality, and what do you call it again? X. XR. XR. I guess I gotta take that one back and see what see what our folks say. See if we can jump into that. I've heard other ones. Some people saying digital augmented reality or some other kind of spatial. And I don't know what they are, but you know we can kind of go on and on all these new names. But I think that's the new new thing everyone's kind of kind of latched their latched their thing on top of, and. HMDs come in all same shapes and sizes. You got the Joint Strike Fighter here. That's a four hundred thousand dollar head mounted display. Four hundred thousand of your hard earned tax dollars are going to. Well, now you're paying less tax, some of you. So that's that's part of your debt. You know. And you got the JG View. You got Oculus. We can go on and on. We got Steampunk goggles, and and on and on. And I, I you know I, I look at all this. Been doing it a long time. There really aren't that many that really kind of wow me. And when I get to the end of the presentation, I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. But before I have that one kind of technical slide, kind of an optics thing. So when you talk about AR and VR, they all do the same thing. They take a display, there's my phone, or something like this, right? They put a lens in front of it, and they put it near the focal point, and voila, it's an infinity. Wow, that's exciting, right? Or and you can move it, go beyond infinity. It's like Buzz Lightyear, you know, do something like that. But the idea is you put it here, it magnifies it, puts it at a certain distance, but that's essentially the, the whole principle. Nothing magical more, more than that. And on the AR architecture, it's even pretty simple. You, know, you get one of these things, or two of them in this case, you put them in front of a cell phone, like when Oculus started out, and you look at it, and it splits the image, do some distortion correction, put some cardboard around it, or some some paper or some plastic, and you, you, you've got an HMD. That's kind of, kind of what it is. And you all wonder why they all look that way? <coughs> it's the optics guy's fault. Because <laughs> they can't figure out how to make it smaller, right? If you have something like this, 
and you have a lens and a certain focal length, you want a certain field view, there's nothing magical you can do to make it small. There, I'll talk about some of that, but back in the, in the early days when it started, that's what you had. That's why they all look like bricks on the faces. <laughs> and that's what I used to tell my team all the time. I say, it's your job to make this look better. And they all look a little sad. And, <laughs> think you're going to fire me or beat me up or, or whatever. And it's the Brooklyn thing, too. They kind of hear it and they, they, get, they, get, they get a little kind of scared. But that's it. In AR, it's, it's, it's a little different, right? The only thing you look through it, I brought a wonderful Google Glass that I think you're all familiar with, right? You put it up here, you look through it. In this case, the, the light comes from the display, bounces off the spherical mirror, puts it in the an analogous part of a, of, a, of a lens like this, hits a beam splitter, collimates it, and you look through it, and, and there it is. And everyone has, they're all different principles, but all different kind of optical systems as, they, as, as you move forward. We all know who this is, don't we? Yes. <laughs> right? Mad Science is ID4. Yeah. Anybody else? Independence Day? That's what I said, ID4. Yeah, also with Star Trek. <laughs> no, no, no. This is what I see every quarter with my team. Because leadership comes up and says, this is what I want. I'll tell you, every time, and my guys, gals, they put their heads down. This is what we want. We wanted a pair of glasses, right? So the optics people, of course, have long hair and ponytails and kind of stuff like that. So they're kind of freaked out. They're going, I don't get it. They don't understand it. And it's all the optics person's fault. It really is. Yeah, you need displays. You need software, I think, you know, you know, and all kinds of things. But it really is a problem. They don't understand that you can't get 180-degree field of view, 20-20 acuity, right? It's got to weigh 90, 80 grams, you know, like this. It's got to look like this. It's a real bitch. We try to make, we're trying to make that happen. So in optics, there are two things. No free lunch. <laughs> and no Moore's Law. It just doesn't work. If it did work, they all wouldn't look like this. They wouldn't look like this. But however, after being kind of, kind of you know, coy there, there's been a lot of progress going on in, in the optical industry. I'm going to put some little things up here to kind of, kind of describe it to you that are a little different than my little simple, beautiful little double convex, concave, aspheric lens. And everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing something. We've got light fields. It's going to solve hunger, you know, and, and, and everything else. I think, I think that's the thing everyone's kind of looking at. The virtual accommodation problem. I mean, you name it. It's going to do, going to do it all. NVIDIA started it. We've got Stanford's doing it. Avagant. Someone said magic leap in here twice. I, I, I think I hear that every now and then. I go to bed, I go, magic leap. <laughs> what, the hell, what the hell are they doing? But that's, that's a lot of money being spent on it. You know, everything being done so you look inside. It'll, it'll correct your vision. It'll do, it'll do everything. Everything and everything. But then the virgin, virgin accommodation problem. This is like the biggest conundrum going on. I'm still trying to figure it out. Why everyone's so excited about it. Yeah, it's a problem. But it isn't the thing, but everyone's trying to solve it. What it means is that when you, let's say I'm looking at my finger, right? My eyes converge on it, but they also focus on it. So that's how the real world works. In, in a VR system, the optics focus everything at some conjugate, let's say two meters. But divergence, such as the object floating out here, like the elephant right in the hand, it's, it's a different distance. So that's, there's a difference there, and there are tolerances that human vision can handle for a certain period of time, and they get sick, or they get uncomfortable, and whatever. So people are trying to solve that problem over and over, so they use liquid lenses, moving lenses, uh, spatial light modulators, light fields. You've got everything in order to solve it. And then there's inline optics. Remember I said before you had that, that situation where you have a lens and a focal plane, and you have some distance between it, and you can't change it? Well, inline optics are a way to fold the path on top of each other to make them compact. And so they call them pancake optics. And there's a bonus for these things, but again, there's no free lunch. Because you see the light is kind of bouncing back and forth. Every time it bounces, you're losing light, which means you need more power, right? You get ghosts. There's one thing bonus about this system, you get very good optical performance. That's one bonus, much more than you would ever hope to get with this. But it also costs more money, right? So it's kind of hard to, to beat the old, the old standby. And then there's these kind of things, wave, you know, waveguides, freeform prisms. That's what Microsoft uses in their systems, and, and people like Iconia, and so many other people where you get collimated, you, you squeeze it into a piece of glass, it bounces around, and then magically it exits. 
but it's a you know it's a nice thin piece of glass and it's nice. But again, there are all kinds of limitations with each one of these systems, whether it's a Loomis system which just uses a bunch of little mirrors buried in a, in a, in a, in a flat piece of glass, or diffractive <coughs> optics, or or a freeform prism. But a lot of money is being spent on this. People investing in it extremely heavily. But again, there's no free lunch and no Moore's law in this one either. And then there's this. <laughs> Does anybody know what this is? Magically, Ronnie Applebitz. It's somebody, I'll tell you that. It's, uh, I have no idea what this is. I mean, we, we sit around and we, we blow it up, you know, we don't magnify it, and we get in there looking at every little piece of pixel, trying to figure out what the hell's going on. We kind of have an idea. But there's, you know, look, look at all that kit in there. There's a lot of lenses and cameras and ultra-depth sensors, I don't know, movie wands and, and fibers and stuff like that. And the guy looks really cool. I, I could never look like that, but, you know, <laughs> but he, learned, he looks really cool. But then you, you look at all this optical stuff and just kind of breeze through really quick, right? Waveguides, moving lenses, cool-looking guys with fancy, fancy goggles. You, you look at all that in the end, this is our old friend. This is what we all use. So there's some kind of disconnect, right? Get these fancy little itty bitty lenses that cost a buck a piece. Then you have all that other tech. So it just shows there's a long way to go to connect those dots in order to get that technology in this to make this look like that. Right? That's what we're all kind of kind of kind of trying to do. But the reason why we do that is because head mounted display design is really hard. And it's a really a delicate balance. This is the fanciest slide I have because things kind of come in and out. I have no videos or anything else. But first of all, you got to do is you got to get the weight down. And I learned this being in the military business because if you didn't get the weight down, people died. Because when they ejected from an airplane and it weighed too much and it wasn't balanced, it snapped their neck. You know, one ever have that kind of responsibility, right? You know, you put some of these others on your airplane again, it's all right. But that's what you're learning. And you've got to be really, really sensitive to it. And every time you add another screw, or you add another ultra-depth sensor, or you add another RGB camera, or another fancy lens, all it is is adding weight, adding money, and it's making it more uncomfortable for people to wear. Then there's balance. You call, I call it center of gravity. In the world from the world I come from, you can't sit like this and lean forward. You know, I think guys like Oculus have done a better job when they came out their last unit. It's a little, a little more lighter and a little more balanced. And we're all trying to be more sensitive to that. Comfort. I mean, weight, balance, coming to comfort as well. Can't get hot, right? Can't be sucking 10 watts into it. That's what that Magic Leap one looks like to me. They have two cables. They look like they're, they're pumping some radioactive stuff into them. <laughs> and this is one of my big ones that I really, I really fight with the teams on. No, no adjustments. If you have to, okay. But every time you add an adjustment, you add weight, it gets more complex, things break. And when you adjust them, who says they're going to be in alignment? Right? Because they're not in alignment, you're going to get sick. There are tolerances that the human just can't handle for long periods of time, especially divergence. If things are kind of cocked like this. <coughs> got to look good. Well, I guess Magic Leap's got that. I, I'm not going to, going to take that. It's got to look cool. You've got to want to wear it. Big one. Gender friendly. Right? Really, really, really important get women to wear these things. You know, it's because maybe guys like wearing it. It's just really challenging. And when you think about that, it makes everything more complicated. You sit in the meeting, you're thinking about, you know, the hair and what they want to wear and the weight and all that. It's you've got to take them into account because if we don't, only half the population is going to wear it. Maybe a third. Kids won't wear it. Women I guess you're right. I, I, I don't no, know. I think you're probably right. Yeah. yeah, I think it's re really, really important. So that being the issue in the first one, even before weight, we've got to think about that when we, when we do our design. And if you don't watch these things, you don't take this into account, and when I said it at SPIE, and some people thought it was funny, I have a yellow, yellow sticky that I give my team, and I tell them to put it on their monitor. So when every day when they come in the morning, they see these things, that they don't forget it. Because what happens is, this is all great, you know, apple pie and all that stuff, but when you start getting in the nitty gritty of designing it, you forget about that. You go back six months and you figure it out you add another 250 grams to it and six more watts and everyone's going, what the hell happened? What the, what the hell happened? Because if you don't do it, 
you don't get it on rough real easy, you get this. <laughs> we have a lot of these here on the, on the fifth floor, things that we, we try, but I'm not kidding, this is what happens. Things end up like this. It's like a, it's like a creep. It just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and heavier and cooler. And then it, but, but then if you know what happens? Everyone loves it because they designed it. <laughs> right? It's just like my baby. You can't call it ugly. You can't do anything like that. So it's, it's pretty, pretty... I've seen it happen all the time. In the weather world that came from, you had a spec. It had to be this heavy, this big, this, this much weight, this kind of performance, this much power dissipation. For us, in the consumer business, or the commercial business, we, we, just, we have to make it not knowing what those specs are. But it can't look like this. Well, I guess it can. You just won't, you won't sell it. And then there's the other part of it. When you looked at all those optical systems, and they got all those waveguides, and they got all that stuff bouncing around, you know, from God's creation. Us optics people worry about this. Things like astigmatism, and comb, and field curvature, binocular errors that get you sick. That's one of the most important ones. And uh, lateral color, axial color. The only aberration that can be fixed by you SWEs is distortion of lateral color. Because lateral color is a change in distortion with color. And that's what everyone has, right? When you look at the phone, and everyone's got their little distorted thing on it, right? And they do, some do lateral color correction on it. But it's not, it's not rectilinear, it's kind of like barrel shaped. So that can, be, that can be corrected. However, there's a penalty for that. The penalty is you get fewer pixels. You, 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 you're you set nothing, again, nothing's free, right? You think it is, but it's not. And they do more processing, using more power, so no, nothing's good. I call these the optics bad boys. And this is the thing that my, I worry about, the optics bad boys. It isn't just whether or not I get light from A to B, it's how it gets there, and then how it gets to the eye. And understanding how the human operates, so we really see the performance of this system in the end. Now I'm going to go through one of my own pet peeves. This is my part of pontification. You know, the, the, the HMD business, you get, a, you get an HMD and it says it's got this, this resolution and, and this field of view and all that. I can tell you right now, I, there's no standards. We really don't have that many standards. I think we have ways to go to kind of get it together. We know what your gram is, right? But when we look at, like, field of view, I don't think anybody does it right. I look at some of the numbers, I go, what? What? And we have to test them. We look at them, and a lot of them don't mean it. Field of view, there's instantaneous field of view, there's total field of view, there's binocular instantaneous field of view, there's all different kinds of, of things. So when you buy a, a Gear VR or a, or a Google, Google Danger View, no one really says where the field of view is being measured from. So you don't know what you're getting. So everyone kind of, if there's no standard, you don't know, right? Just like you get a camcorder and has all the, the specifications listed on it. But field of view is just like a knot. You have a circle, you get closer, the picture gets bigger, you move back, it gets vignetted, it's, it's smaller. So field of view has to be measured at one point, which is the eye box, and that has to be a standard. So that's one of my little pet peeves. There are no standards. No one says, if you pick up a system where the eye relief is, or he wants glasses accommodation, nothing. And this is probably the most famous one. One of the biggest fallacies in all of it is acuity. So everyone defines acuity with, <coughs> right, pentile. Most of us, if you look at your monitor, on your computer monitor, it's RGB stripe, or some kind of a red, green, blue makes a white pixel. The reason why phones don't have that, which is the majority of, of VR systems use, is because it's related to power. But if you look carefully, you can see that it goes red, green, red, green, blue, doesn't go red, green, blue. And then there's all the signal processing, which really screws up the resolution. So when you draw a white line, it isn't a white line. It's like this blurry kind of thing that goes across, right? It isn't, it isn't even necessarily alias, and there's so much space between the pixels. And so when they, when they advertise what the resolution is of these HMDs, they just count the green pixels. They don't count the red, green, blue, blue white pixels. 210 degree field of view. How the hell did they do that? I gotta figure that one out. You know? Well, the way they do it, it's a thing called binocular overlap. They take two of the binoculars and they cock them out. But boy, that's really challenging. I mean, when, you, when, you, when you go back to the optics bad boys and you start analyzing a system like that, boy, it goes crazy fast. 
So what happens when you, you take these oculars, you move them out, there's a lot of human physiological problems called looning that come in, into play. Forget about all the optics bad boys. There's a physiological thing that happens where you see there's rivalry between the eyes, and you see like these blank areas between it. Some people see it, some people don't. But if it depends if it's convergent or divergent is the magnitude of what it, what it has. So that was kind of it. I wanted to kind of shorten it up for you. I know it's late. It's late for me too. And, and uh, I have a lot of friends, a lot of help when I do these presentations. This is a June, June Grog and Wilhelmina. My wife said, was I really going to put it in? I said, yeah. <laughs> so if I put it in photonic plus, I would. And uh, it was funny because when I the story, the true story is I did Photonics West. I thought I, my presentation was in the afternoon, and I, before I went to bed, I, I looked and I said, oh my God, it's the, one of the first ones in the morning. So I had to go downstairs in the bathroom and practice with the dogs <laughs> so they could, could understand. They, they, they give a lot of good feedback and, and great questions. So I'm looking forward to hearing now uh, what you have to say. Um, so before we let you guys go and kind of chat with each other as well as the speakers, um, just wanted to kind of like thank all the volunteers. We got Lucas, Casey, the door earlier. We got Jesse, essentially having a camera, recording this whole thing. Hopefully it'll be posted later. We got Lux, taking all the pictures, um, as well as Anna, who, you know, pulled everything together and intro uh, us. So if you guys are interested in more of this, We've got um, another meetup that's coming up next month on the 29th, so March 29th. It's going to be at Microsoft Reactor. Great. Let you guys go. Thanks a lot.